So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Walter Spiegel. I am a member of the board of directors of the Jewish Council of Public Affairs. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today for what promises to be an educational and challenging discussion for the next hour. JCPA is the network hub for 125 Jewish Community Relations Councils across the country and 16 national organizations. JCPA works with other ethnic and faith-based communities to advance policies that reflect our Jewish values, including fighting against hatred, bigotry, racism, and anti-Semitism. These are, needless to say, trying times for this nation. We've watched video of the murder of one man at the hands of police and the consequences of years of systemic racism in law enforcement. We've experienced the outpouring of decades of pent up pain in the black community. As we move forward in these uncertain times, it is imperative that we educate ourselves, that we open ourselves up and listen to disparate voices, and that we find ways to work together to advocate for justice. And while we know that the current moment flows from decades of injustice to the black community, we also know that systemic racism that affects one community manifests itself in varied forms and lays bare other societal ills. In the past few years, we have witnessed the emergence of new and even more violent forms of white nationalism. We saw it in Charlottesville, in Pittsburgh, in Poway, and now in state capitals across the country amidst the pandemic. We know we're at a, we are at a precarious moment, but we don't really know what it means or how to respond effectively. So today, we're very fortunate to have with us two of the very best minds on these issues. Amy Spitalnik is the Executive Director of Integrity First for America, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to holding those accountable who threaten longstanding principles of our democracy, including our country's commitment to civil rights and equal justice. IFA is backing Signs versus Kessler, landmark federal lawsuit filed by a coalition of Charlottesville community members against hate groups responsible for the August 2017 violence in Charlottesville. Trial is scheduled for October 2020, and Amy's going to talk to us more about that. Amy joins IFA with over a decade of experience in government politics and advocacy, including with the New York Attorney General, the Mayor of New York, and the New York State Senate. Amy has also worked on numerous federal, state, and local campaigns. Eric Ward is Executive Director of Western State Center, a senior fellow with the Southern Poverty Law Center, and senior advisor with Race Forward. Eric is a nationally recognized expert on the relationship between authoritarian movements, hate violence, and preserving inclusive democracy. Eric's accomplishments over a 30 plus year civil rights career are simply too many for me to summarize today. Eric's writings and speeches are credited with key narrative shifts, and Eric has wrote the seminal article on how anti-Semitism animates white nationalism. Before, before I turn over the program to our presenters, if you find these types of programs useful and this work to be important, we do ask that you please consider supporting JCPA by going to jewishpublicaffairs.org. Thank you, and Amy, I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Walter, and thank you to the JCPA for hosting this uh, very important discussion. I think when we first started discussing doing an event together right now, we had no idea how timely uh, it would be, and I'm thrilled to be here with Eric, uh, who I've been very fortunate to sit on a number of panels with over the last year or so and always learn so much from. Um, so. Um, and I think this is such an important conversation because you can't separate the moment we're in right now from the rise of white nationalism and specifically the violent white nationalism that Walter just described. We know that the murderers of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery and Tony McDade and so many others 
are tragic, but also the unsurprising result of a racist and broken system, which is the same system that has fueled Charlottesville and Charleston and so many other white supremacist attacks in recent years. And as we'll discuss, the same ideology we see at play among those trying to exploit and distract from the protests in this moment right now, trying to deter from the fight for racial justice, is the same ideology that we see fueling this broader cycle of far right extremist violence. And there's so much to do to take this. At IFA, we believe one of many, many, many necessary ways to take on these systems of white supremacy that poison our country is to do so by going after those at the center of this violent, uh, of this violent movement, the hate groups and the leaders that are embedded at the core of this cycle of violence that we've seen. And Charlottesville provides an incredibly important way uh, and lens to understand this. What happened in Charlottesville is both illustrative of the rise of white nationalism. The violence there was truly a flashpoint that demonstrated how emboldened these neo-Nazis and white supremacists are right now. But it also provides a unique opportunity to actually do something about it, to take on those responsible who have deep connections to this broader cycle of violence and hate. And so to start, I think it's important to remember what actually happened in Charlottesville. Um, first, on August 11th, in, uh, 2017, I'm sure we all remember viscerally watch it, uh, the feelings we had when we watched those Tiki Torch marches um, on the University of Virginia. These neo-Nazis and white supremacists chose to carry Tiki Torches to specifically evoke the KKK and the Nazis. They descended on the University of Virginia. They surrounded a number of peaceful counter protesters at the Thomas Jefferson statue. They beat them up. They threw fuel and lit torches at them. Nearby, an interfaith gathering had to shelter in place because it was dangerous to leave. Um, one of our plaintiffs said he thought he was going to die that night, an African-American man. Um, the following day was sadly no different. Instead of marching on the University of Virginia, they marched on downtown Charlottesville, um, where first they um, decided to surround the local synagogue, chanting things like Sieg Heil, um, holding semi-automatic weapons, the synagogue had to be evacuated, including the Torah scrolls. The detail that always sticks with me most is the fact that among the Torah scrolls was a Holocaust scroll that had been saved from Nazi Germany. And in 2017 in America, it was yet again under Nazi threat. And then of course, the violence continued targeting African-Americans, Jews, anyone who was willing to stand up for other people's rights. Um, it culminated of course, in the now infamous car attack in which James Fields drove his car into a crowd of peaceful counter-protesters, killing Heather Heyer, injuring many others, including a number of our plaintiffs. Um, and so what's important to understand here is that none of this was an accident. For months in advance, these neo-Nazis and white supremacists spoke on social media chat rooms that were littered with racism and anti-Semitism and other forms of hate, and they discussed every last detail in advance about what was going to happen from what to wear, what to bring for lunch, to which weapons to carry, and how they could hit protesters with cars and then claim self-defense, which is of course exactly what they ended up doing. So at Integrity First for America, we're suing the two dozen neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and hate groups that are responsible for orchestrating this violence. This is the only current legal effort to take on the broad leadership of this movement. And I think particularly right now, it provides a very tangible way to take action against the violent white supremacy and broader extremism we see poisoning this, com uh, this country. And again, with the potential really to take on, take down through bankrupting them, the leaders and groups that are at the center of this movement. We're suing them under a number of civil rights statutes, most notably something called the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. And I think this is particularly powerful right now. This was an act first passed by the Reconstructionist Congress to protect recently freed slaves from Klan vigilantes, <clears throat> rising them in the South in order to undermine their rights. It was meant to protect against racially motivated violent conspiracies, which of course is exactly what happened in Charlottesville. And it's one of the few civil rights statutes that deals with private conduct as opposed to governmental conduct. And frankly, I think if there's ever a perfect example of how much work we have left to do, it's the fact that a nearly 150 year old statute passed to protect recently freed slaves from the Ku Klux Klan must be used today in 2020 to take on white supremacists and neo-Nazis. Um, so, a few other quick details on the case, and then I wanna talk about why it matters and how it fits into this broader fight against white nationalism, white supremacy, uh, anti-Semitism, and racism. 
Our plaintiffs are 10 community members who were injured in the violence, some during a Tiki Torch March, many during the car attack. You could see a number of them in an iconic photo of the car plowing through the crowd, including Marcus Martin, who was sprawled across the back, his then fiance, now wife Marissa, who he pushed out of the way, and many others. And they suffered extensive injuries from broken legs, cracked skulls, um, and so on. Our defendants really are at the core of the neo-Nazi and white supremacist movement in America. I suspect you will know many of their names. Richard Spencer, Andrew Anglin, Chris Cantwell, Matthew Heimbach, Identity Europa, Vanguard America, League of the South, certain KKK groups, it goes on and on. And so why does this case matter? How does it fit into what we're here to talk about today? Of course, this case is about justice for our plaintiffs and for Charlottesville and holding those accountable who are responsible for what happened in Charlottesville. James Fields did not act alone. The violence that we saw was part of this much larger conspiracy and we believe that all responsible, all 24 responsible for orchestrating that violence must be held accountable. But this case is also about taking on those and bankrupting and dismantling the leaders and groups that are at the center of this movement who have much deeper ties to the broader cycle of violence. And so even before we get to trial and win large civil judgments against them, we've shown that there are very severe legal and financial consequences for participating in these sorts of violent conspiracies. Um, the other week, for example, our legal team won over $41,000 in sanctions against three key defendants. One was actually thrown in jail. Um, and some defendants like Richard Spencer have talked about how this case is quote, totally detrimental to what he's doing. Um, a few have tried to rebrand or even claim that they're leaving the movement. And while we're deeply skeptical of that, I think it does underscore the pressure that they're facing. And so when we win large civil judgments against them at trial, we'll follow them around for the rest of their lives and collect on those judgments and ensure that anything they own, they earn, they raise goes to our plaintiffs. And this is so important because these individuals and groups are at a center of a much larger movement that we see terrorizing this country over and over and over again, including right now during these protests. So for example, the Pittsburgh shooter who killed 11 at Tree of Life a year and a half ago communicated on Gab with the Charlottesville leaders before killing 11 during Shabbat services. The Christchurch shooter who killed dozens of Muslims praying in mosque last year painted onto his gun a white power symbol that was first popularized by one of our defendants. And Christ Church in turn inspired Poway and El Paso. And in fact, just the other day, there were reports of um, a terrorist in Germany who was trying to, inspired by the Christ Church attack, attack Muslims there. And similarly, we now see our defendants uh, and other white supremacists and far-right extremists trying to exploit both the coronavirus and perhaps most importantly, the protests that are happening right now to spread disinformation, terror, and violence. Um, many of you might have seen the report just the other day about a white supremacist group that posed as Antifa in a viral tweet that urged violence in white neighborhoods. That was Identity Europa, one of our defendants, and that is part of their much larger effort to use disinformation, terror, and fear to try to spread their violence. Similarly, earlier this week, an admitted Ku Klux Klan leader plowed his car into a crowd of peaceful protesters in Richmond, Virginia, only about an hour away from Charlottesville where James Fields did the same exact thing nearly three years ago. And again, we see here these concerning trends of how these white supremacists operate. These car attacks have become a deliberate tactic among white supremacists fueled by online memes like the one we saw in the Discord chats that are central to our Charlottesville case. And of course, there have been other far-right extremists showing up at protests with the goal of what they call the boogaloo, which is a civil war, or in some cases, an actual race war. Then of course, there are the conspiracy theories. And it's the same sorts of conspiracy theories that we see not just now in this moment, um, but stretching back, fueling the cycle of white supremacist violence that I described. Um, for example, the idea that George Soros is orchestrating the protests, which has the benefit of being both anti-Semitic and racist. Anti-Semitic because the idea of Soros or Jews in general as puppet masters is truly one of the oldest anti-Semitic tropes in the book. And racist because it's meant to delegitimize and undermine the fact that these Black-led protests around the country could be so successful. It dovetails very well with the quote-unquote replacement theory we've seen in places like Charlottesville Pittsburgh, Christchurch, Poway, El Paso, and many others, which is the idea that Jews are orchestrating the replacement or genocide of the white race through our sport for the black community, refugees, immigrants, and others. It's, for example, 
why the Pittsburgh shooter chose to target Tree of Life, because they worked with HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, in supporting refugees. And I'm confident Eric is going to speak about this in much greater detail and far better than I can. So I will leave it there for now. Um, and I will, just to bring it back, I will say all of this is to say um, that we believe that we have a unique opportunity in this case to take on those who are at the center of this violent, hateful movement, to bankrupt and dismantle them through these large civil judgments, and to have a significant impact on their ability to operate. But we also think that this case is important because it's so critical to our national conversation to lay bare the hate and the violence of the core of this. So this case cannot establish a clear legal precedent that exposes and holds accountable the, the violent racism, and the anti-Semitism, the xenophobia, the other forms of hate it promotes and organizes, and it can create a deterrent for other extremists. But we also know that when we have a weeks long trial in Charlottesville, steps from where the violence happened, it can create help fuel a larger public reckoning on violent white nationalism and white supremacy in America and lay bare um, the hate at its core and underscore just how important it is that we do something about it. So, to, to wrap things up, I will say, in doing this work, I, I think often about my grandparents who survived the Holocaust. The rest of their families weren't so lucky. I know that this is a story I imagine many watching share. And so in watching what's happened in this country over the last few years, from Charlottesville, through the many other attacks, through the institutionalized systemic racism that we're finally having a much needed public reckoning on right now, it's very easy to feel angry, and it's very easy to feel helpless and scared in certain ways. Um, and I think probably particularly so after I just spent 15 minutes telling you about the pervasiveness of white supremacy in America. But there is a difference. Unlike my grandparents' generation in Europe, we actually have tools at our disposal that we could use to fight back. We have the right to protest, to use our voice, as we're seeing right now. We have our laws, and we have our justice system. And that's what our work is about at IFA. That's what this case is about. Um, it's about using the tools we have in, in fighting to ensure that they provide the justice and the accountability that they're supposed to. Um, so I'm so grateful to all of you for being a part of this, for tuning in, looking forward to your questions, and most importantly, looking forward to learning from Eric, which I always do. Thank, thank you, Amy, for that fascinating presentation. Uh, before I turn it over to Eric, I just want to remind anyone who is listening in on the call, that you do have a question box. And so if you have questions, uh, please uh, send in your questions. We, we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric, who's gonna talk for about 15 minutes, and then we're gonna take questions at that point. Thank you. Thanks so much, Walter and, and Amy. Thank you for your work in holding uh, hate groups and, and white nationalists accountable for, for the violence um, uh, that they utilize. My name is Eric Ward. I'm executive director with Western State Center. We are a progressive civil rights organization based out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, we work region-wide in the Pacific Northwest and inner mountain states. Uh, to advance a national discussion and, and policies that strengthen racial and gender equity in the United States. Uh, we believe the advancement of gender and, and race equity in the United States is uh, one contribution to strengthening inclusive democracy. We, we find ourselves, I think, like most Americans right now, uh, in a whirlwind of, of changes and, and crises, whether we are talking about the global pandemic of, of COVID-19, uh, whether we are talking about uh, the massive unemployment uh, that is happening in this country, uh, or whether we are talking about the largest uh, civil rights protest uh, to ever take place in, in the United States. We are all certainly experiencing this change. This change is, is significant, um, but as we all experience it, I think it is important for us to note uh, that there are some in our, in our country who experience it more than others. Currently in the United States, uh, according to, to recent research, uh, one out of 
every nearly 1,800 African Americans in the United States has died over the last four months uh, from COVID-19. That is at a rate that is nearly three times uh, as large as uh, white America and uh, nearly uh, double uh, the rate that Latinos um, are experiencing it. It has devastated the African American community in significant ways. On, on top of that, we are also dealing with the increase of unemployment, which has disproportionately impact, uh, impacted African Americans. Now, with Black communities carrying both of those burdens already, uh, we have seen an increase both in uh, disproportionate police violence, but also vigilante violence uh, targeting African Americans, collimating, I think, in, in Minneapolis uh, with the killing of George Floyd uh, and local Black community leaders have been uh, responding ever since. Uh, I call it actually one of the largest public, public referendums on racism in America uh, to have ever occurred. And much of the credit really goes to uh, leaders at the local level who have come together to support the Black community across lines of race, religion, gender, uh, and, and sexual orientation. Uh, it can uh, be euphoric. Um, to see these conversations happening. Uh, a recent uh, newspaper article in the New York Times uh, says that uh, the majority of Americans support uh, the demands of Black Lives Matters and the majority of Americans actually uh, support uh, African-American concerns uh, around racial uh, discrimination. That is a huge shift that has taken place uh, in just the last year, uh, but it's a significant shift that has taken place over the last 75 years. I would like to briefly counterposition the fact that the majority of Americans uh, now support the basic demands of Black Lives Matter with the fact that not once in the lifetime of Martin Luther King did American, the majority of Americans support uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, in the 1960s, the majority of Americans never supported uh, uh, the civil rights protesters who were engaging in uh, nonviolent civil disobedience. This is a huge shift in uh, where Americans are, uh, and it's a critically important shift uh, that we often don't acknowledge or, or, or take hope in. But I want to talk a little bit during this time about underlying that. With every gain comes a backlash. So too was the rise of the white nationalist movement in America. Most of us are familiar with the white nationalist movement because of the events in, in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, where neo-Nazis uh, marched on the streets in, in Charlottesville, chanting, Jews will not replace us. Most of us are familiar with the white nationalist movement when we look and, and see data in, in national papers explaining to us uh, that white nationalists have killed uh, nearly 280 Americans uh, in the last five years alone, um, that it makes the white nationalist movement the largest perpetrator uh, of domestic terror uh, currently within our country. But the white nationalist movement also has its own roots and its roots lie in the victory of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And I, I think this is important for us to understand. I distinguish white nationalism from white supremacy. White supremacy is a system of exploitation, both historic and, and present day. It was built on the discrimination of African-Americans through chattel slavery, uh, the theft of, of native lands and, and resources, uh, and the control of sexuality it was how society organized itself. None of us are responsible for the creation of that structure. It is one we have grown up in, uh, but it is one we are responsible um, in terms of not carrying forward. But white supremacy is a system. 
white nationalism is better understood as a social movement. It is a social movement that actually is opposed uh, to the current system of white supremacy. And let me explain. Here we have this 1960s civil rights movement led by black leaders seeking to end segregation uh, and to secure voting rights. Uh, it is a movement that uh, grows and builds political power uh, and is ultimately successful in its goals. Now imagine you grow up in a white supremacist society. You believe black people are inferior. How then do you explain that black people defeated you politically? Do you all of a sudden say, well, I guess I was wrong. Black people must be equal. Not likely. And so hardcore segregationists, those who believed in the separation of the quote unquote races, who believed they were superior because of the color of their skin, uh, had to come up with another explanation. If white supremacy, the system of exploitation, was written upon the paper of race, the explanation that white nationalists would then develop is written on the paper of anti-Semitism. These arch segregationists are never going to allow that they lost to African Americans. To do so would be to recognize the humanity of folks they saw as inferior. So they began to scapegoat another community, borrowing from anti-Semitic rhetoric and ideology out of Europe. They developed a theory that in fact, they didn't lose to blacks, but that they lost to a Jewish conspiracy. That Jewish puppet masters, a la the anti-Semitic protocols of the elders of Zion, manipulated black people into shaking the foundations of white Christendom, as many white nationalists put it at the time. What this anti-Semitic conspiracy theory did is that it allowed arch segregationists to hold on to the idea of white superiority by centering Jews as the cause of their problems. Jews became the cause of their problem, whether we were talking about racial equity, labor rights, women's rights, public education, or a host of other issues. Jews were placed as basically a supernatural other pulling the strings of vulnerable communities. In short, white nationalism denies the legitimate grievances and the agency uh, of vulnerable communities such as Muslims, immigrants, African-Americans, gays and lesbians, and others and places the burden on, unfairly on the Jewish community. We know the outcome of this type of rhetoric. We saw how that type of rhetoric led to the mass shooting at the Tree of Life in, uh, in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, in Poway, California. We have seen that it is not just confined to whites, uh, but to other people of color, such as some of the mass attacks that happened in Jersey City in December, um, but also uh, just outside of New York City, uh, where a Jewish congregation was attacked uh, by an individual with a machete. The power of the anti-Semitic ideology of conspiracy and world domination continues to dominate within our society. The truth is, is why white nationalists have, have heralded a new form of, of anti-Semitism in America. What we also have to understand is that they didn't do it in a vacuum. The truth is this, if white nationalists are utilizing and organizing anti-Semitism, it is because anti-Semitism already exists in our society and they are merely tapping into it as other social movements have done across the political spectrum. This is important for us to hold. But I wanna turn back to the white nationalist movement. Why is it different from white supremacy? If the system of white supremacy is about inequality, white nationalism is about ethnic cleansing. It is not seeking to preserve the status quo, 
but to overthrow the status quo in order to create a white only ethno state that is free of people of color and Jews altogether. One of the misnomers of the white nationalist movement is that we believe it wants to take us back to some type of made up fantasy past, but that's simply not true. The white nationalist movement does not seek to take us back to the days of gone with the wind, uh, but in fact is trying to form it a violent revolution in the United States to overthrow the federal government. As one armed militia leader uh, said back in the 1990s, he said, first we will deal with the federal government and then we will deal with the question of the Jews. White nationalism is on the rise in the United States. Uh, we have seen its influence all the way from the White House uh, into rural communities and urban neighborhoods around the country. Some cases in point include most recently FBI and other law enforcement reports that uh, elements of the white nationalist movement and those who are adjacent to it, such as the Boogaloo Boys, have attempted to infiltrate Black Lives Matter protests in order to disrupt and to create more tension and violence in what they hope will spark a race war. Right now, across the United States, in suburban and rural communities, we have armed white vigilantes who are patrolling their communities, seeking to repel what they believe is an invasion uh, by anti-fascist activists. We have received reports such as in Squim, Washington, where a couple who were multiracial and their children were surrounded by an armed mob while they were camping, that this armed mob both threatened them with weapons and then cut down trees in order to prevent them from escaping. We have received reports of not only armed vigilante groups, but of local law enforcement agencies also claiming that these invasions by anti-fascists are true. I want folks to stop for a second because we may just run that off as another curiosity, but I wanna say it again. Right now across America, not in one community, not in 10 communities, not even in 20 communities, but in dozens upon dozens of communities right now, there are armed vigil anti paramilitaries running around with armed weapons, stalking nonviolent protesters, and seeking armed confrontation with an invisible fantasy armed invasion. That is the state of the society we live in and our democracy is on a precipice. So what do we do? And I wanna talk about this in the next three minutes because I believe there are three things we should do right now. First, we must support the legal advocacy efforts of organizations like Integrity for America, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and a host of others who are seeking to hold accountable those who are willing to use violence um, and terror in order to spark uh, the breakup of the United States, in order to intimidate those who are simply engaging in their civil liberties. It is critically important that at a time when our federal government appears unwilling to do so, that we support organizations who are trying to expand that type of accountability and transparency through the legal process. Two, we have to understand that this cannot merely just be a civil and criminal solution, right? That it is time for the rest of us, the silent center, to begin to speak up and act. It is time for us to begin to articulate what we mean when we say America and describe what America looks like. And we need to back it up with both policy and advocacy. That means addressing the inequalities in economy, the inequality socially, 
and also ensuring that our institutions do so as well. That means holding our elected officials accountable and putting their feet to the fire in a way that we have not done for decades. It is up to them to use both their political and moral leadership right now to an advance in America that moves forward together. The opposite of that is continued chaos and the continued weakening of de democratic institutions that put us all at risk. The third though, is to understand that beyond the large electoral policy movements, beyond the legal uh, strategies that must take place, that good old fashioned organizing and education still matters. And we shouldn't forget this. The civil rights movement didn't just take place in Birmingham and in Washington, DC. It took place in thousands of local communities of whose stories we have never heard. So too is this moment. This is not a fight that simply takes place on election day or in the courthouses. This is a courageous conversation that needs to take place in suburban and rural and urban communities across the country. That means investing in individuals, that means investing in social change organizations, and that means investing in our civic institutions. That means both with volunteer hours and with our financial support. We should keep in mind that at the end of the day, the white nationalist movement, as much as a threat as it is, will not win because of its own ingenuity. It will win because of our silence. It will win because we choose to stand aside and watch history unfold before us as a historical curiosity. We have to do better than that. I want each of us to think about what is the story that we want told about us 10 years from now, when our children and our grandchildren ask us, what did we do in the midst of the 21st century civil rights movement? Let us all be able to look them in the eye with pride and tell them that like George Floyd, we too changed the world. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for that powerful presentation. So um, we've had a lot of questions that have come in and uh, I'm gonna try to pose as many of them as I can to the uh, presenters in the next 20 minutes. We'll maybe try to go a little bit back and forth. And also, I think there'll probably be some overlap between those. So I welcome both of you to comment. Um, I'm gonna start right now, we'll go back to Amy. And we had a number of questions about the uh, litigation related to the Charlottesville situation. Um, and, and so I'm wondering if you could provide some more specificity on that where the case is filed, the, the types of claims that are, be assert, that are being asserted, what the status of that case is, and also talk a little bit more about what you see as the long-term effect of that litigation. Absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll try to include a whole bunch of different facts quickly for the sake of time. Um, our, the case is filed in the Western District of Virginia, which is the federal court in Charlottesville and, and the trial itself will actually be in Charlottesville steps away from where much of the violence happened, which will be quite powerful for a number of reasons. Um, it is two blocks away from Heather Higher Way where the car attack happened. Um, and you can't sort of walk down the downtown mall in Charlottesville without viscerally understanding how terrifying what happened must have been. Um, the case is, you know, we're, we're almost three years out from Charlottesville, so I don't want to pretend like it's moving quickly, but we are moving as quickly as possible given um, the size, the scope of the litigation, um, and the fact that many of our defendants are, as our lawyers like to describe them, evil 12-year-olds, um, or act like evil 12-year-olds in their refusal to comply with court orders. Um, we've won 
countless court orders requiring them to turn over phones, computers, social media accounts where they plan the violence, where they continue to spread violence and hate along the lines of what Eric uh, and I both described in recent uh, in recent weeks and months. Um, and some have finally started to do so. Others have claimed their phones have, for example, fallen in the toilet. Um, and some have actually destroyed evidence. Increasingly, we are winning these sanctions motions, including the over $41,000 in sanctions we won a few weeks back and uh, starting to see uh, real consequences for their failure to comply. Um, we're scheduled for trial in October. The court has you should still proceed under that assumption. And we are holding video chat depositions and using other tools to keep moving it forward right now. Um, and certainly we think October when we're having a national, obviously we're having a much larger national conversation right now on these issues, which is quite powerful. In October, when we are thinking about the values we represent as a country and where we think it's really powerful to begin this trial um, and underscore the crisis of white nationalism and hate uh, and lay bare the violence that's truly at its core. Um, so uh, yeah, and I think in terms, I think the last bit was the impact of the case and mm -hmm. what we truly expect. Um, I would say there's there's three three potential impacts. Um, and I apologize if any of this is repetitive with what I said earlier. I think first and foremost, of course, justice for Charlottesville, for our plaintiffs and accountability for those responsible. I talked, I think, um, about the potential here to truly bankrupt and dismantle the leaders and the groups that are at the core of this movement through these large civil judgments and the other penalties we've won. But in the longer term, there are much more sort of national impacts, if you will. Um, certainly making clear the legal precedent here that if you are part of these racist, violent conspiracies, you will be held accountable is incredibly important. There is some strong precedent as it relates to the Ku Klux Klan Act and other statutes we're using. But of course, we are dealing with a statute that's 150 years old. And while personally, I don't think there's much of a difference between the Klansmen who you know, wore white hoods and organized in the, in the woods in 1871 when this was passed and the white nationalists and other extremists who are doing so now to spread terror and violence, perhaps or social media, which has in some ways become the planned end of the 21st century. Um, certainly the ways in which this conspiracy was planned and orchestrated online um, and making clear that there will be very serious, severe consequences for that is, incredi is incredibly important. Um, similarly, the deterrent effect, we've already seen the deterrent effect in its inability to, um, for example, stop a number of these extremists from returning to Charlottesville in 2018. Many of them said they didn't want to be sued again. Others, I believe I mentioned Richard Spencer earlier, has talked about how this has been totally detrimental to his ability to operate. I mentioned that some groups, including Identity Europa, which is the group that posed as Antifa as a means to spread and encourage violence around these protests, um, uh, they've tried to rebrand as American Identity Movement, as have other de defendants. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, a few have even claimed that they're leaving the mo movement, even though we're deeply skeptical. And so this deterrent effect is incredibly important, showing that there are very, very severe legal and financial consequences for part of, uh, for uh, being part of these conspiracies. But I wholeheartedly with, agree with Eric. I also think that this case alone is not a silver bullet. It is one of a number of tools we need to all be encouraging and using here and using our courts is incredibly important for a variety of reasons, but it needs to go hand in hand with policy changes, with societal changes, socioeconomic changes, with so many uh, law enforcement changes, of course, and uh, so many other things that need to happen um, and that uh, Eric beautifully described. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Eric, let me let me turn to you. Um, in, in, in the last few weeks since the video uh, of has come out of Minneapolis. We've seen an outpouring of protests across the country, across all ethnic groups, across all faith-based groups. And so what I'm wondering is, in your view, are we seeing somewhat of a, a, a change in this country? Are we seeing a watershed moment? Um, and, and, and Amy, please jump in on this as well, uh, that is turning against these, these hate groups um, 
And so what are your thoughts on that? And how do we as a community support that? Yeah, this is this is a good question. You know, it's a it's a nuanced question. And um, I'm going to be a little bit complex here. But the first thing I want to say is uh, we are witnessing uh, a shift in, in our society. Uh, we are a society that is in the midst of a debate around national identity, uh, around citizenship, of, around civil rights. And uh, in those debates, there are always backlash, right? Um, uh, we don't get gain uh, without backlash. Uh, the backlash, though, is um, is dangerous in this moment because our democratic institutions and and um, are uh, so weak. So, so here's what I would say: We should know, right, through nearly every uh, data point, right, that uh, the majority of Americans believe that uh, discrimination against African Americans. Uh, is is significant and and serious. Uh, we know the majority of Americans um, believe that it's time for us to move from 20th century policing, right, to a 21st century model uh, that grounds us in community safety, right, uh, not brutality, not fear, uh, but but safety. I imagine if we drill down there's gonna be lots of opinions around what that looks like. That is why democratic practice is important. But at, the, but at the end of the day, what can sink any kind of true debate uh, is our unwillingness to really confront this white nationalist threat uh, that seeks to instill fear, that seeks to chill that conversation, right? that seeks to wedge communities against one another by fomenting uh, violence. And we have not spoke out forcibly enough. Uh, we have not empowered uh, lawyers to, to hold those folks accountable. We have not surrounded elected officials with our support and encouragement to be moral voices against that. And we certainly have, an, have not invested in our communities. Our communities need to be much more well-versed on the mechanics of anti-Semitism. They need to be much more well-versed on the practice of, of nonviolent civil disobedience. And they need to be much more well-versed, right, in understanding that what is happening right now is not just impacting Black folks and, and Indigenous communities. It is impacting all of us. And how we come out of this moment uh, really dictates and really in real ways what future generations will have to grapple with. And I think it is time to stand up for our children, for our grandchildren. Uh, and we do this by taking white nationalism seriously, which means also taking anti-Semitism seriously. So thank you for that, Erickson. So let, let me follow up on that with, with a follow-up question. And Amy, I'd like to get your thoughts on this as well. I mean, there are historical relationships between the black community and the Jewish community on the issue of civil rights. Um, and, and, and I think many people would say that over the course of the last several decades, those relationships have, have frayed. And so the question becomes, how do we work together? How do we rebuild those relationships? What's the obligations of the Jewish community on these issues of racism? And conversely, what are the obligations of the black community on the issues of anti-Semitism? Yeah, well, look, here is what, what I think. Um, we, we have to understand that both uh, racism and anti-Semitism function in our society, not just as a set of behaviors, but as a set of attitudes, perceptions, uh, and, and structures, right? Um, and if we don't understand those things, uh, we are likely to practice them at times of great stress. People under stress are more likely to express and embrace forms of bigotry. So where I think we should move forward is by first understanding, yes, there, there is a history between uh, the Jewish and, and Black communities in America. Uh, 
Uh, that community, that that history is a little bit more nuanced, right? It wasn't all um, roses, uh, but there were also real moments of alignment and, and solidarity, right? Uh, one of the reasons that the civil rights movement advanced uh, uh, one of the key cornerstone legislations, which was the Immigration Reform Act, uh, as part of the civil rights package, was because of the horrors that Jews experienced in Europe uh, when they and could not flee to the United States because of immigration policies. There are also, let's be clear, many stories of young Jewish students, right, and, and some Jewish leaders uh, who joined with Black civil rights activists in the South. But it is equally true that tensions between the Black and Jewish community in the urban North were also very real. But what I think unites the Black and Jewish communities and other communities as well is the fact that all of us in the United States want a society where all of us can live, love, and work free from fear and with the possibilities of our children and grandchildren being able to embrace opportunity. That means getting back to the basics. That means understanding that I can express anti-Semitism even unintentionally, and that folks in the Jewish community can express racism unintentionally. Sometimes we can do it intentionally, but those conversations are hard to have if we continue to refuse to try to understand how those two issues a function. So my challenge to the Black community is that we need to spend time learning about anti-Semitism to understand it because it makes our movement stronger. And my challenge to the Jewish community is to spend time trying to understand racism, right? Because it makes your movements and your community stronger. And making us stronger right now strengthens, strengthens democracy. We can also work on things such as housing, education, transportation. Those are things that align us. I tell folks all the time, you don't have to agree with every call that is being made by the movement for Black Lives right now, right? But not agreeing with things, right, isn't an excuse to find the one thing you do agree with, right, and to help move that agenda item. That's how we get to know one another together by doing work together again. Great, Amy, you wanna jump in on that? I wholeheartedly agree. And I think the only thing I would add is that as, as a Jew, it's important to understand that this week, this moment, this is not about us right now, and that's okay. The best thing that we can do is be the best possible allies to the black community and show up and support them right now. And even if we disagree, with something as it relates to Israel, even if we have quibbles about certain parts of certain platforms and certain black organizations have promoted, we need to put that aside and recognize that all of our fates are so deeply intertwined right now that the authoritarianism, the police brutality, the total lack of justice that the black community is experiencing is of course dangerous to them, but if we continue to let it happen unfettered and unchecked, it is also to continue to jeopardize our own futures and the futures of anyone else who doesn't fit into this very national and narrow definition of what these far-right extremists believe America should look like. And so we have an obligation as a Jewish community right now to put those potential differences aside and to just show up and support and, uh, and be there in this moment because we are in a truly pivotal moment right now. Um, and certainly this is a moment about the black community, but we are also being incredibly um, narrow in our approach if we don't recognize the ways in which we support the black community right now will have uh, increasingly dangerous impacts on our own community and so many others. Yeah. Eric, if you would talk a little bit about, um, you've had some questions, how pervasive, and, and Amy jump in the, on this as well, please, is the white nationalist movement and how integrated into society would you say that that movement is? And, and, and what, what do we need to be doing to kind of root that out, so to speak? Yeah, so 
Um, here's here's what we know. I mean, we we understand uh, that uh, when you ask uh, the ma the majority of Americans, uh, and I mean the far majority of Americans, uh, will tell you uh, that they oppose the white nationalist movement. But a poll that was done by the University of Virginia uh, did something interesting a few years ago. It, it took out the term white nationalism and just uh, put forth in the questions the goals, the, the goals of the white nationalist movement, uh, the core, uh, uh, core ideas. And it asked then Americans, what do you think about those goals? Uh, and then when they did that, over a third of Americans actually said they agreed with those goals. So while the majority of, of Americans don't agree with white nationalism, uh, nearly a third of Americans actually agree with the core tenets um, of, of white nationalism. The, the idea uh, that America is a white nation, uh, for instance. So I would take that piece of data, then I'll take a piece of data uh, from over a decade ago, uh, when the Federal Bureau of Investigation uh, released a memo warning local law enforcement uh, agencies around the country that white nationalists uh, were joining law enforcement, right? Um, uh, becoming law enforcement officers. And um, for over a decade, uh, law enforcement agencies chose to do nothing. Uh, but then you see some of the behavior of individual law enforcement officers. Uh, we are catching, you know, video is starting to be documented that lead us to believe that, in fact, it is possible those who harbor sympathy, at least, towards white nationalists uh, are clearly functioning uh, within um, uh, within law enforcement agencies. And we know some stories uh, where law enforcement officials have been dismissed because of those ties. The, the last piece that I think we should take into account uh, are the recent nonviolent protests where large numbers of individuals have been showing up uh, to stalk and, and to intimidate those protests um, and uh, have done so without any intervention uh, by law enforcement or by uh, the Department of Justice to ensure the safety of nonviolent protesters. And, and this leads me to believe that while white nationalist numbers are not very high, their influence is quite significant right now. Um, it is so significant that much of our policy debates in this country have shifted from debates around inequality and progress, right, to debates around criminalization, right? So we never talk about immigration reform as a debate around opportunity and progress in our society. The debate actually resides around how many children can we put in detention camps uh, of and how long can we hold them there um, uh, without them being uh, put place back with their families, right? We are now in a situation where we actually debate whether we should hold people who have committed no violent crimes, right, in cells where they are catching COVID-19 and dying from it, right? because it is about punishment and criminalization and social control. Okay. I will answer this question with something David Duke said to someone. David Duke, a longtime Klansman, a white nationalist theorist, who is now, I believe, in his, his late 70s, early 80s, was asked how he felt about this moment. And his response was that he never thought he would live to see this day and that it is the most exciting moment he has ever experienced, right, on his time on Earth. That is from one of the leading white nationalist theorists in the United States, and I think that answers the question around how influential the white nationalist movement has become.
it's a that's a scary thought. Thank you, Eric. Amy, I want to give you the last word on following up on Eric's comment, and then unfortunately, we're going to have to bring this uh, fascinating discussion to an end. You never really want to go after Eric. But I, will. <laughs> I, uh, oh, I will just echo some of what he said. Look, I think it's it's easy for the vast majority of Americans to look at neo Nazis and say that's bad. It's easy, for example, just yesterday it came out that an Ohio National Guardsman was a member of Vanguard America, which is a neo Nazi group pursuing for its role in Charlottesville. And I, I hope that he is quickly dismissed. Whether he is is probably a testament to the moment that we're in, that even those things are difficult. What's much harder is to look at the ways white nationalism, other forms of extremism, penetrate every other element of our society and the ways in which we might ignore um, the white nationalism that is percolating under the surface, the Confederate flags that you might see on the you know, bumper sticker of a law enforcement officer somewhere. Um, and it's all of our obligations to recognize that it's not just the neo-Nazis marching on Charlottesville, although certainly at IFA, we believe that going after them is incredibly important, but it's using that as a way to open the door to understanding the much larger impact of white nationalism, hate and extremism in America. Um, and we all have an obligation to do so. It doesn't stop with simply saying neo-Nazis are bad or white, na you know, armed white nationalists descending on our cities are bad, but rather using that to understand the much broader implications of this moment and the ways in which these policies, as Eric described, the moment we're in are so deeply interconnected. None of this is an accident. White nationalists, neo-Nazis, white supremacists marching on Charlottesville, people trying to co-opt the protests happening right now to spread disinformation, violence, and extremism, and policies like putting children in cages and banning Muslims from this country are all part of this much larger system. Um, and understanding that interconnectedness is so critical to protecting both the Jewish community and the Black community and so many other communities right now. Okay. Um, thank you, Amy. And, and thank you, Amy and Eric, for what has truly been a, a fascinating hour. Uh, I wish we could go on longer, and I'm sorry that I didn't, wasn't able to get to everyone's questions that were uh, that were sent in. But thank you again for that. Uh, I would tell everybody this has been recorded, so you're welcome to go back out to uh, the JCPA website to access the recording on that. Uh, and also, if you again, if you believe these types of conversations are important and critical. Uh, I would encourage you to support JCPA. So thank you, Eric. Thank you, Amy. Uh, thank and you. thank you to everyone who participated today. Thanks. Thank you all so much. Thank you.